Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Closure Show. As always, I'm your host, Scott Carson. Excited to be here today with you guys. <clears throat> Today's episode is all a little bit about the numbers. It's a little bit about knowing what numbers and how to backtrack those numbers in, but also how to kind of identify your time and, and how can you effectively hit those numbers. Because let's face it, nobody likes to set a goal and, and not accomplish it. I mean, a lot of people, don't get me wrong, come January 1st, we're setting numbers like I want to lose so much weight or I want to make so much money or I want to get in the gym. We all do things, but then we often end up failing <laughs> in the first week. We end up failing in the first month. And uh, <clears throat> one of the big things that I think is important when working through goals, working through numbers, working through things that you want to accomplish is setting <clears throat> attainable goals, okay? But instead of just throwing a number out there out of the blue, taking some time to look at those numbers. What does those numbers mean? How many offer, you know, do you have to make offers? How many emails does that make? How many, you know, bids do you have to look through? How many notes do you have to look through to find those numbers? What type of income are you making off those goals? All right. So that's that's the big, big thing I want to discuss with you guys today. Cause literally right now, through the end of the month. And then through the first part of October, too, as well, for those that are watching this live or even those that are listening, uh, one of the big things that I'm working through uh, a little bit at night, uh, a little bit during the day, outside of my main focus of, of what we're crunching through everything every day, is kind of starting to plan 2019. I know. It's not even October yet. What the hell are you doing planning 2019? Well, it's important to plan 2019, start planning 2019 so I'm prepared for when it arrives. All right. I'm preparing the different places that we're going. I'm preparing some of the things that we're looking towards. All right. I'm planning on what our focus is going to be and how we're going to accomplish it by starting to work the numbers back in. Where do I, what do I have to set? What do I have to do? Um, what dominoes do I have to put in place so that when I can hit it on August, or sorry, not August 1st, but on uh, January 1st, those dominoes start to fall to find success. All right. So let's let's the biggest thing you have to look at is how many hours do you have to put into what you're focused on? Okay. If you get 10 hours a week, 10 hours a week is great. Okay. 10 hours, 20 hours a week, because we figure everybody has from 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. Unless you work a night shift, then you usually have some hours in the day. If you've got 10 hours in a week, it's 40 hours in a month. That's that's a doable thing. Okay. You can squeeze out an extra week of the month and turn your four week month into five weeks by doing a little things on the side to help out with that. Now we're not talking working an eight hour day once you get off of your job, because let's face it, that's a burnout waiting to happen. If you've got family, you've got kids, you're not gonna have full eight hours when you get off of work to focus on what you wanna need, on, uh, on what you want to with a note business or real estate business, okay? So big thing is look at what you're currently doing, okay? And, and be honest with yourself. Let's not blow smoke to yourself. Let's not lie to yourself. Focus on things. What are you really doing during the day? Uh, if you're a realtor and you're busy out doing realtor transactions and things like that, you can't count it towards your real estate investing business because that's the business of being a realtor. Same thing with being a mortgage broker. All right. If you're out getting leads for your mortgage business and you're doing constantly other things, that may not give you a lot of time for your note or real estate investing business. Okay. So let's be honest. Let's be honest with ourselves, okay? Uh, good morning, Laura Blunk. Yes, it's a soggy. Good morning from Central Texas. A little sogginess here in Austin. I, th I looked like a taco, but I see it's an umbrella. Okay, emoji, good stuff. But anyway, so let's let's look at yourself. Now, if you don't have anything else to do, then you have really no excuses not to be working at least 40 hours a week in what your, your business is, okay? Um, and let's... Like I say, you got to be honest with yourself. If you spend your time a lot of time on Facebook or LinkedIn and you're not doing effective things on there, eh, that's a problem. All right. So look at what your time is. What are you really? Are you really putting 20 hours a week in? Are you putting 40 hours a week? Some of you putting in 60? Let's just face out what it is. And if you're working very hard, let's just face it, you're probably not going to work 60 hours a week every day or every week. That's going to get a burnout. You're going to have some ups and you're going to have some lows. You're going to highs and lows. You're going to have some. Peaks and you have some valleys. That is just normal with what it is. You're going to have some great times where you're excited. And other times you're like, oh, I'm just dragging. I'm a little tired. Okay. 
the thing I want you guys to realize is everybody goes through that. Okay. Everybody goes through peaks and valleys. Everybody has times that drag on. Okay. Um, the, those are some of the biggest things I can tell you is just keep, just keep cranking out. Just keep focused on things. Keep, keep pushing toward, but let's go back here. Let's look at your numbers. So if you got 10 hours a week, okay, you're working on things versus 20 hours or 40 hours, okay, or 30, whatever you have to figure that out, okay? What needs to get done, okay? First and foremost, the number one thing that you guys have to be doing, obviously, is reaching out for assets. If you're looking out for assets, that's the, the base, that's the minimum thing that you've got to do with marketing is be reaching out to get assets. And that's either A, through banks, that's either through hedge funds, um, and what are you doing? Are you just reaching for the low hanging fruit where everybody else is? If that's the case and you're looking to buy the premium assets, you're going to pay premium price for that. Okay. Uh, you have to also start looking at, start building some systems in place to help you with your marketing. If you're constantly going and doing one off different things, you're not giving your marketing a lot of time to have success. You're not really giving your time to be able to measure your results, what's going on. And that takes time. So I still, I'm still a big believer that especially in the note business, you know, it's a lot less uh, marketing time as far as like the physical stuff. You're not sending out postcards. You're not posting bandit signs. Okay. If you're really working uh, your marketing time in the note business, that's consisting pr primarily of reaching out to asset managers. And that's pretty easy to do. Uh, <clears throat> pretty easy to do when it comes to your marketing aspect of things. Okay. What's that? What's that mean? Basically, you're setting up your Infusionsoft or your Mailchimp or your um, uh, Aweber accounts, whatever your email service provider is. That's what you're setting up to get out. And I know a lot of people love the idea of pulling an asset manager list and sending an email. What 90% of people fail at doing is setting it up once, making sure all their links are working, and then replicating that. Okay. That's literally a one day activity, literally a few hours activity that can set you up for months out. Okay. And literally set you up for months out. What do you have on your books this month? What do you have on your books this month? What do you have on your books this month? Okay. That's the important thing to look at. Those are some simple things to do, but a lot of people fail to do them. Okay. Because the fact is they just get tired or they, it, they spend time on one email and then they forget about it and they don't get to it on a consistent basis. Now there are people that send out emails every you know Sunday night or every Monday. For the most part, that's great. They're writing something new marketing, but taking the time to go ahead and pre-write your email list is important to get done to because that's a very very valuable thing. You could do that once and really kind of save you time later on going forward. The person to replicate and recreate the email every month. Go ahead and set it up and send out three to four months or even six months of emails, schedule them so they go out the first Tuesday of the month. That's not hard to look at with a calendar, okay? That's a very smart activity, and you can do that off times. You can do that at night. You can do that on the weekends. You can do it during your lunch break if you need to. You can start setting that stuff up if you're working full-time. Now, if you're working, if you're not working full-time, but you're a no-full-time real estate investor, note investor, I would do that something in the morning, something in the evening. I would not really spend a lot of time on that during the middle of the day, okay? Do it in your off-peak hours. Because one of the best things that you can do, I mean, for brand new, yeah, go ahead and send it out, get it out. But the idea here is that your biggest act, your best activities for a note investor is marketing for deals and raising capital. And then once you get your deals in, evaluating, going through the due diligence and working through those systems and then making offers. And then once, if you do buy it, then handing that off to your team because your team was working nine to five. That's your attorneys, your servicing companies, right, your servicers. Uh, any other special service you have working for you, your vendors, those are working during the day. Those are your nine to five activities. Those are the phone calls you need to make, be making. Your also phone calls on nine to five are to the banks and the hedge funds. If you're going to make some phone calls. All right. Remember, we talk about the times to do that. 10 to noon, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, or also two to five on the same time, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Would I make phone calls on Monday? Would I make calls on Friday? But I would spend time, spend a couple hours a week reaching out to people that open your email, open up your asset manager emails and following up with them. Um, and big shout out to Melanie and Phil Jacobs. They shared with me that they've been sending emails out to the uh, the asset managers that have opened up the last few emails and their open rate is like 41, 42%, which is a pretty good chunk. 
and they're getting lists sent to them. They're being smart. They've sent some emails out here for the last three months, and they're starting to get tapes sent to them, one-off deals, some awkward deals. As I say, they're not the traditional bread and butter, but they're still getting deals sent to them, which is just from the consistency of putting the systems in place. And they're both very busy people. Phil still works full-time for a major auto uh, company, and Melanie also has her consulting practice as well. So the fact that they're doing this in their part time, part time is smart time, okay? So <clears throat> when you look at that, how long does it take you to write an email? Eh, and half an hour, hour if you're getting started first time. The first thing you wanna do is once you've got your email, if it's good and you get all the links looking good, you have somebody review it for the first couple of times, make sure your spelling is correct, is then set it up, then that's where you replicate it, okay? So, but let's let's go back to, well, how many emails do I need to send out, Scott? This sounds like a lot of work. Eh, the hardest work is the phone calls more so than anything else. Emails is pretty relatively easy, okay? So let's talk about some numbers. Because I think we all need financial numbers to kind of drive where we're wanting to go. And if you look at what you want to make, do you want to make six figures? Do you want to make 50 grand? What is it that you really want? Do you want to make 10 grand a month as your ultimate goal? Okay, great. 10 grand a month, that's 120 grand a year. Okay. Um, thing to keep in mind that that's you break it down, that number down. If you want to be making 10 grand a month, okay, you got to break your numbers down. Now, if you're using other people's money, you got to figure you're going to be splitting the income coming in off your assets. So figure what's your split. If it's $400, $500 a month, it's $500 a month is what's coming in on average on your mortgages that you're buying, that you're getting reperforming. Then let's figure that out. All right. 10 grand divided by your split of 250 a month. That comes to a total of 40 notes that you need to do. Okay. And if you want to get that in your first year, what's that come down to? 40 divided by 12 months. It means you need to be closing on at least three and a third, about three, three notes every month. That's not bad. That's totally attainable now. But the question is, how many offers do I need to make to get to that three closed? Well, 10% close ratio, 3.3 notes. Multiply that times 10. It means you're going to be making 33 offers every month. Divide that by four weeks. It means you need to be making about eight offers a week. Okay. Very, very attainable. It's two a day, real, realistically, when we think about it. Those numbers are attainable, but knowing your numbers, okay, keeping a track, how many offers did you make this week? How many offers did I make next? Did I make last week? And starting to see the bids, because that is ultimately what happens. When you're making offers, you have offers that you're putting out to the hedge funds and the banks, stuff like that. You need to keep track of how many offers. I always try to like to have 20 offers uh, in the hamper. Now, I do things a little bit differently is I track uh, one offer could be 100 assets. It could be one asset. Depends on the tape size. All right. Because I like to spread my stuff across because sometimes when you're buying uh, portfolios, not all of them are going to get accepted. Not all of them. Sometimes somebody will outbid you for the whole thing. Okay. That's just that's just the business. That's just what happens. Don't get frustrated. Realize if somebody outbid you especially if somebody bought the whole tape, which will happen from time to time. I like to use it as an opportunity. Okay, great, uh, Mr. Seller, who bought the whole tape? Or do you mind forwarding my bids to them? Be, they'd be willing to talk to me about me maybe carving out some of their assets, okay? It's not a bad thing. It's a great way to build relationships, okay? So if you're looking back at your numbers and you've got to do eight offers a week, okay, two a day, all right, that's not that hard to do. When you reach out to the hedge funds, when you reach out to banks, getting in the process, give yourself the 90 day window to get things wrapped, ramped up, not wrapped up, but ramping up. Okay. If you've been in the business for a while and you're struggling, Hey, you come back to the basics. I know a lot of people get sidetracked with going to conferences or going to events, you know, going to networking events. They think that they're doing something at the end of the day to look at what was the value of that event? What was the value of it? Did I get contacts? Did I make a lot of great uh, acquaintances? Did I collect a lot of business cards? I can put in my database for marketing because that's really the second phase of what you're doing. All right. Besides just making offers, you've also got to talk to investors about raising capital. You got to get out what you're doing, and and one of the basic and best ways to do that is email. Um, I am not the biggest. I, I like posting stuff in the social media stuff. I'm you know it's definitely a great way to get the word out and stuff like that. 
but depending on where you're posting, if you're posting it to a real estate group or you're posting it to like the WCN crew, private Facebook group, you're probably not going to raise a lot of capital because we got a lot of sharks in there. Okay. They're looking for the same thing. Okay. So you have to look at how you're leveraging your list, your time outside to help. Is that going to the Propelia meetup groups in Dallas or San Antonio and or sponsoring an event and like the Quest Expo? You, you may have to drop some money on stuff, stuff like that. Okay. Or you just got to be a mad scientist about going out and meeting people. Hi, here's my car. Can I get your car? There, there's some things you got to develop. I don't necessarily like running around and trying to collect 100 cards in an hour because you don't build any really fruitful relationships that way. I like going where maybe others aren't going. Okay. I do like going to the Quest IRA events. I like going to self-directed IRA events. That's a great thing to go to. But you also careful there's a lot of sharks there. Okay. So I like harvesting things. You guys have heard me talk about, you know, pulling IRA investors off the county appraisal districts. I think it's one of the most underutilized tools. And if you are going to do some direct marketing or direct mail marketing, that is an effective use of time. Okay. It's an effective use of time reaching out to investors. Now, Eric Hyde comments here this morning. Hey, I'm kind of like a mad scientist, LOL. I don't know what you mean by that, buddy. Because you've got a bit of a weird job, you know, some on, some off. <clears throat> that you've got, you know, time being a cop and then time being off. So the, the whole idea, like I said, is to, to, to look at and balance with what you're doing. If you've got a full-time job, hey, you have to really kind of stretch your numbers out a little bit. Instead of maybe getting eight offers a week, maybe it's four offers a week. Maybe it's going to take you a year to get to five grand in cash flow. All right. Maybe it's going to take you two years to get 10, 10 grand in cash flow. But the idea is that every asset you get, it's not, we all know that's not ultimately going to be turn into a reperforming note. I wish that was the case, right? <laughs> some of them you're going to have to foreclose on, some of them you're going to sell off, some you're going to wholesale. The idea that I can tell you this more so than anything else is the more offers you make, the more you'll work through. It's just that's the case. And I know it's stupid. It's the total A equals B. If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. It's the whole Pythagorean theorem when it comes to note investing. If you're making more offers, hopefully you'll end up closing more deals. And in that case, you'll be making more money, right? Making more offers equals making more money, okay? Some that you'll get reperforming, and this is that cash flow. Yet money coming in and uh, perpetuity. But others, when you're foreclosing, selling off, those are bigger checks, which are great too. Nobody does not, I'm not gonna you know, turn down a, a check with a comma in it with sizable numbers to the left hand of the comma. What I'm trying to get at is set your numbers up for the cash flow basis because that's really the least coming in per month. And obviously, with bigger checks, bigger assets, you're going to get some bigger checks in. You're going to hit that 60 grand or that 50 grand a year, or 100 grand a year, a little bit faster by focusing on it. But the thing I can tell you this more importantly, most importantly, and this goes out to the wholesalers out there, is look, don't be looking to flip at notes to other people. Look to buy for your own portfolio first. Look at that asset as an opportunity for you. Why do you like that asset? Because your conviction, the reason you love that asset, when you've done through the due diligence, you really like that asset, that will come out in your market. That'll come out when you're talking to investors. It'll come out is a much better way versus just shoveling stuff or just taking orders. And none of you want to be a note waitress or a note waiter. All right. You don't want to take other people's orders. You want to order for yourself. You want to be ordering from the menu, not taking somebody else's and trying to find it. Now, don't get me wrong. When you start off wholesaling, great way to make some cash, but don't be doing it for like 200 bucks or 500 bucks. That's just not worth your time. Your time is worth so much more than that. All right. But knowing your numbers and what you have to make offers on, knowing how, how many you have to do in a week or how much you have to do in a month. Those are the big things. And, and do yourself a favor. Don't spaz out if you're not hitting that in the first month or first two months. There's some people, they buy a couple of notes and then they, they go dark for a month or two because they spend time, spend a lot of time on trying to find those assets and then I get back to work. And so it's, 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 I like uh, what Don Riga boss said. There's a constant dance between the paper and the property of different things. Because once you buy something, then you've got to spend some time working on it. you got to work out that stuff. You've got to get your vendors rock and roll. You've got to get your the collateral files uh, scanned in and, and sent out and stuff like that. Those are some of the big things I you have to do to help yourself 
be able to capture and be able to make that money on it on, on assets. So, like I said before, if you look at it, what how many do you need to be closing on a month? If you need to be doing eight a month, here's another way to take that number and figure out how much in private capital you need to raise. Because if you got to do eight assets uh, a month <clears throat> to hit that number, roughly, well, if you just figure the average purchase price is probably around twenty-five grand, if you, or fifty grand, whatever your asset class is, whatever you're looking at. So, say if you're looking at at least fifty thousand dollars assets, then take twenty-five thousand as your mid price, as your funding amount. Now you're probably buying them at twenty and putting a little bit of extra in there for servicing and workouts for a little bit in your national bank. So it'll fine. That's twenty-five grand times eight. What's that come to? That's two hundred grand a month you need to be raising capital for. Now, some of you at the end of the year, that's 2.4 million raise to hit your number. Don't flip out. It's quite all right. All right. If you're doing stuff on a regular basis like that, it becomes second nature that you're raising stuff, especially if you're marketing, you're not networking. You you pick your numbers, you pick your spots that are be the biggest bang for your buck. I know I've had I've had several students that were very heavily on networking going out once a week to invest investment clubs, meeting and meeting with people. And they did that, all right. Um, you just talk, you go out, and, and they get, they figure that out. And after a while, they're like, "Wait, this is it was effective, but I've lost my focus." Okay. <laughs> Jeffrey Wolf says, "I work for paydays, not tips." Nice. Okay. All right. I guess I did, didn't I, Eric Kai? Eric says. When I asked him what I mean by that, I just talked about mad scientists. I totally did that exactly. Um, the thing I, I'm trying to get at, guys, is putting a million dollars together in private capital isn't that difficult. I know it seems, when I was first starting off, I was like, oh, my God, it seems impossible. It seems impossible if you're especially starting from zero. Moving that big rock up the hill or moving that big rock down the hill is difficult. It seems impossible until you get a little momentum going. You get a little momentum going, and you can put some things in place, a little push, a little steady effort, you're, you're becoming the little engine that could, or really not the little engine that could, but the little engine that did. And I, I'm a big believer. Oh, I think I can. I think I can go out and raise capital. Okay, go out and raise it. Um, one of the great stories I love sharing is our buddy Wayne Snell. Wayne's one of our best students. Done a great job. A couple hundred assets. Wayne, uh, when he originally started off, he was funding things with his own capital. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. If you've got the ability to do that, Great. But he was very scared to raise capital from other people because why? Why was he there? Because he'd actually had some bad things happen to him earlier on. Okay. And I was like, listen. The thing I kept telling Wayne is like, listen, it's going to be okay. Just go out and talk to people, know the deal. And so we had our note mastermind event in San Antonio. Um, this goes back a couple of years. And he actually he, he came to the event. And this was a, a, we used to have our masterminds be five days, like Monday through Friday. I mean, they were like fully intense, okay? He went out, I think it was a Tuesday night or the Wednesday night of the event. And instead of going out drinking with a lot of us and masterminds getting in trouble that way, he went out to the local investment club meetup, okay? And he had a meeting with a, a private investor through an introduction from somebody else in the mastermind. And he got to talk about some of the deals he's done, the type of deals he did. Basic stuff that we regurgitate over and over and over again. He got out there to talk about the type of deals he was doing, and the investor was willing to write him a check right there, or tell or wire. I may I don't may not have the specifics of that, but anyway, the investor was willing to invest with him. Wayne came back the next day, and we could not get him to shut up about it. He was so excited, like a, a kid at Christmas, All right? Total kid at Christmas, and. We it was so great to see him because it was a total mind shift, literally mind shift. He went from not believing him in his duties to having a lot of faith in making things happen. And I see a lot of that happening with students out there. I see a lot of that happening with our, our rock stars out there. They, they have a, a something happen and some total mind shift of what they can accomplish. Some of you guys that are watching this this morning, I've seen mind shifts with you guys and gals. Okay, and the thing is great about seeing those mind shifts is it, it's life changing. Those moments are life changing. And Stephanie remembers that. Bless him. <laughs> I think some people are like, we can, we can get Wayne to shut up the next day. He was all over the place. He was just so jacked up, which is phenomenal. And that is what I want to have happening for all you guys and gals out there. That's what we do this for. 
Um, there's no greater joy in seeing you, ha- you guys and and just seeing success happening, seeing you guys grow as investors, as individuals, and seeing this mind shift take place because I didn't get in this note business years ago just to be myself, just to be one man on a mission to help save thousands of Americans. I knew I could never accomplish my goals by myself. I knew that I needed help to get things done. And yeah, I had a big mind shift when the capital raising from one project that I didn't end up doing, but it was a mind shift of reaching out, making phone calls for a day and getting people to get excited about the project that I was working on. They knew the numbers because I was looking at buying the asset for myself. I wasn't looking to wholesale. I was looking to buy the asset for myself. I was excited about it. And the excitement came along. That mind shift that day, over a decade ago, I still remember it to this day. I still remember when people said, yes, we'd be doing it. But I also remember the big, 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 uh, what I thought was a failure turned into something successful when the asset didn't turn out to be exactly what I thought it was. And I had to go back and explain to people that said they were interested why it wasn't a good deal. And then they, in turn, shifted back and said, yeah, we'd be glad to work with you. We'd be glad to get some things rock and rolling with you. Just get us on the next deal. And I think it's what you have to realize is so important is you have to have a little bit thicker skin in the note business because your numbers, this is not going to be, you're not going to hit a thousand. You're not going to go a hundred percent efficiency. You're not going to be perfect at your pitches. You're not going to be perfect at the bids you place. You're going to strike out. You're going to swing and miss a lot. All right. And it's okay to swing and miss. It's okay to make some offers and come back. And they're like, what the hell are they smoking over there? Okay. It's okay. Oh, crap. I made some offers. But the thing I want you all to get at is you're in the game. As long as you're putting your 10 hours a week or 20 hours a week or whatever you're putting in, make sure you're getting maximum effort. Okay? You're getting the whole Deadpool maximum effort out of your time that you have. Whether it is 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. or if you are full-time, look at what you're really doing. Now, if you're failing, you're you're spending a lot of time, like we all end up spending time throughout the week on on wasted stuff. Do yourself a favor and do a little bit better today. Do a little bit better tomorrow. Do a little bit better next week, okay? Hold yourself accountable. Maybe you need to put a sticky note up somewhere. Hey, I got to hold myself accountable. Or put your numbers up there, okay? And celebrate. As you close deals, celebrate. Hey, one of my favorite things to do. And a little celebration, especially when I finish up a workshop or we complete a big tray, is sit outside, good cigar, good Rocky Patel decade, crown and Sprite, and sip on it. Just sit there, enjoy it, relax a little bit, figure out where, where we're going next and going from there. But we also love to travel. We close on a big, big trade. We love to travel. We like to book events. We like to book travel stuff. It's our way of rewarding ourselves to go out there and, and recharge our batteries. Because I will tell you this, if you do the same things over and over again, it can get kind of boring, but it also, it's every day is a little bit different. Every day is a little bit different with what's going on. You don't know the country western song of the asset that you're buying. You don't know what your investors are going to say. You may have one conversation that leads you down a path. You're like, holy crap. I, and it means you, you meet people um, that you never thought about. And hey, buddy, good to see Joseph Warren down there this morning. Cigar, cigar and port is the perfect marriage. Yeah, I like a good Tawny Port as well. Good 20-year port. Yeah, it's a great marriage and relaxation. Good to see you this morning. Stephanie Goodman says on here, base hits are more realistic than home runs. They are. They are. And sometimes when you're swinging into an asset, you you think it's a base hit. It turns into a home run. It just keeps going and going with good stuff. Okay? <clears throat> you're going to learn something new from every asset that you make an offer on. You're going to learn something new about yourself. You're, you're going to develop skills with every asset you close on. Every deal you make, every email you send, every conversation you have, it builds upon itself. You are failing forward every day to get to where you want to be. Am I the man that uh, I thought I'd be 10 years ago? (laughs) I look back at the last 10 years, it has been a crazy ride. But I also know that the next 10 years are going to be even crazier. Okay. Um, Good stuff, Mr. Dan Deppen. Congratulations. Just closed on one this morning, celebrating with golf this afternoon, but submitting more bids first. Congratulations to you, my friend. Proud of you. You're doing great stuff, Dan. So what I want you guys to do, I want you to think about this, is look, take the time, write your goals down, 
I know we've still got a quarter left of the year left, and you've got a lot of opportunity. Think back to what you were thinking about the first of the year. Think back to what goals you want to accomplish this year. If you're working full time, if you've had a few setbacks. Hey, guess what? Everybody's had setbacks. Everybody gets them. It happens. Welcome to the club. I don't bat a thousand. I strike out on a lot of things. I goof up on things just like you all. People ask me all the time, Scott, how do you accomplish so much? Look, I accomplish so much because the things that I do, I'm able to repurpose. Okay. I've got a tremendous amount of, of people that support me. I've got a, a tremendous network. And that's the beautiful thing when you're building a business, whether it's a note business, a real estate business, whatever you keep working towards, every person you meet can help you and vice versa. You can help every person you meet. This is the, one of the best things I love about where we're at today is it's never been, you've never been able to find somebody that you need to meet easier. If you're doing the things with the networking, you're thinking, doing the right things with the marketing, you're leveraging LinkedIn contacts, you're out networking, you never know who you're going to meet. You never know what kind of influence they'll have on your business or vice versa. Okay. Great Friday indeed. Exactly. Stephanie says, exactly. <coughs> so um, that's the biggest thing I can tell you. Write down your numbers, take a second, put it on a sticky note, tape it to your keyboard, put it somewhere where you can see some things. Those are the most important things I can tell you that are going to help guide you on success is knowing your numbers and posting them and then sharing. That's the third thing, sharing them, working through your numbers, working through your marketing, but then also talking about what you're trying to accomplish, especially if you've got spouses um, that may not, or family members that may not be the most supportive, share what you're doing. And, sh and, and as you're making strides, as you're making strides, that belief will turn from maybe unbelieving to, mm, okay, maybe they can do this, or yes, they can do this. You are proving me wrong, okay? We all deal with that. We all deal with people that aren't supportive. And the best thing I can tell you to do is try to block those people out for a little bit or just take a break. Maybe not block them, but take a break from them, okay? Take a break from maybe their negative energy. Take a break from them really kind of that, that mental, I won't say abuse, but that mental blockage that comes with when you're dealing with negative people. Just walk away from them. Just put it on the side and focus on your path. I talk about staying in your lane a lot, focusing on what you're doing. Just focus on what your focus is, what your numbers are. Your numbers are your numbers, not somebody else's numbers. And the sooner you get to underst you understand that, the sooner that you realize that it's your journey you're on, you're not on somebody else's journey and vice versa, it makes life a whole lot easier to get things. It also makes your numbers a whole lot more attainable because now you're not spending time on looking at what other people are doing or waste your time on things that have no, no, no influence on your business except taking your time away from you. All right. So that's what I wanted to leave you with it on this, uh, this Friday afternoon here in Austin, Texas on the podcast. If you guys are listening out there in iTunes and Stitcher, once again, thank you so much for listening. Um, Thank you for all the kind words. I, we've uh, we've gotten quite a few uh, emails in from people. I, I want to thank all of you for listening. Thank you for all for sharing. Um, thank you for subscribing to the, to the show. Really, if you could do me one thing, is please, please, one of the big things we're trying to do with the podcast is uh, get our reviews up a little bit. Love to hit the uh, 100 review mark here before the month is out. Take a time. If you, love, if you listen to the show, love what we do, take the time to go on to iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. We'd really, really appreciate it more so than anything else. A uh, couple questions here. Um, we've got Eric Hyde says, my wife used to not seem to support the note investing we were doing. So I created a system that she got to enjoy the rewards every time we closed deals or got a reinstatement, et cetera. She's totally on board now. Yeah, you basically, anytime you can give somebody a shut up check, <laughs> and that's not necessarily a shut up check, because uh, we, I've met your wife. Her wife is a beautiful person. Uh, I know she's just probably a little skeptic. Probably things like, "Who the hell is this Scott Carson guy?" You spend a lot of time to probably your kids too. But lovely family, Eric Hyde. That's the beautiful thing is that you have your family share the rewards of your hard work, and that's phenomenal. That's the most important thing that you can do. Dickie Baldwin from Houston. Have a great and profitable weekend. Thank you, Dickie. You too, bud. Uh, and then we had Keith Baker. Thank you, Scott Carson. Thank you, Mister Private. Lending podcast guy, Keith Baker. Glad to see you on here. We had him on as a uh, show 
two weeks ago. Looking forward to the episode coming out, or if not already out. But anyway, um, once again, everybody, know your numbers, work through your numbers, and give yourself some credit. Look, if you're one of these people, I'm going to do it in 30 days, you're probably not going to do it in 30 days, okay? We put a plan, a 30, 60, 90 day, six month, and then one year plan into place and work those numbers back from where you want to be, more likely you'll have a plan that works better for you. At the end of the time, uh, you'll look back and say, okay, good. You, you'll probably get closer to hitting your numbers versus somebody that does not have your numbers planned out. If you don't have your numbers planned out, you have no real guide. You're a ship at sea without a rudder. And your rudder in the note business is knowing what your goals are, know what your numbers need to be, know how many offers you need to make, and how many people you got to reach out to and talk to to raise capital. So with that, guys and gals out there, our extended note family and note nation, I want to say thank you again for listening. Uh, thank you for sharing. Go out, make something happen, and we look forward to seeing you all at the top, everybody.